أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ونعلى الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي قال تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أو من كان ميتا فأحييناه وجعلنا له نورا يمشي به في الناس كمن مثله في الظلمات ليس بخارج منها كذلك زين للكافرين ما كانوا يعملون Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 122 and is one who has and, and is one who was dead and we gave him life and made for him a light by which he walks among people like the one who is in darkness from which he cannot emerge thus to those without faith their own deeds seem pleasing now this verse, there's a discussion among the ulama as to who this verse is referring to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing a comparison between someone who comes to faith, who discovers faith, submits to God, and someone who stubbornly rejects religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strikes an example. He says, the one <clears throat> who comes to religion, who submits to his Lord, is like someone who has come to life. You see, brothers and sisters, most people have the impression that when I come, when I, if I become religious, I have to give up a lot of things in my life, that my life loses flavor, that I become a dull person. Whereas in the Holy Quran, religiosity, True religiosity is described as something that gives you life, something that enhances and enriches your life experiences. And someone who stubbornly rejects. Now, there are many different categories of kuffar. This verse seems to be referring to someone like Abu Jahan, who did not even allow the Holy Prophet to speak to him, who was not even, even willing to listen to the message of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes such people, people who are so stubborn, as someone who is engulfed in darkness and is unable to come out of the state of darkness. Now the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, there's a difference of opinion among them as to who the, this verse is referring to. It seems like the majority of them believe that the example of the stubborn disbeliever is Abu Jahan. You know, someone who not only would not lend an ear to the Quran, but he used to prevent others from even listening to the Quran. And the one who is described as coming towards the faith and being given life some say that it refers to Hamza, the uncle of the Holy Prophet. As you know, Hamza joined Islam in Mecca. The narrations say that one day he received, he was coming back from a hunting trip because he was a hunter. He used to go to the desert. He was returning and he heard and he saw that Abu Jahl was abusing his nephew, the Holy Prophet. So, Hamza intervenes. The traditions say that he punches Abu Jahl and prevents him from further assaulting the Holy Prophet. And then Hamza ends up becoming a Muslim in the formal sense. So some say that the ayah is referring to Hamza, that prior to his official acceptance of Islam, and when he came to the faith, it's as though he was given life. Others say that it's a reference to Ammar al-Nayas. So again, the Qur'an 
beautifully describes submission to God as something that revitalizes the soul, something that gives you life. It's as though you were dead and now you are truly living life. Now, in addition to coming alive, the Quran, when it speaks about faith, it says that it gives you life and it also gives you light. So it gives you hayat and it also gives you light. Meaning that faith allows you to find your way in life. You're able to distinguish right from wrong. You have moral direction in your life. And also, you are able to illuminate other people. See, the beauty of light is that it allows other people to benefit. Now, the believer is able to find his way, find his path. He's able to walk the path of righteousness. And he also is able to be an inspiration for others. You notice that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of iman, he uses the word nur. That faith allows you to acquire light. And nur is in the singular form. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Rejection of faith. He mentions the word zulumat, which is the plural of zulm, darknesses. And this is a recurring theme in the Quran, this idea that the path of truth is one, it's singular. Whereas the paths of deviation are many, are numerous. In the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا فِي كُلِّ قَرْيَةٍ أَكَابِرَ مُجْرِمِيهَا لِيَمْكُرُوا فِيهَا وَمَا يَمْكُرُونَ إِلَّا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ And thus we placed within every city the greatest of its criminals to conspire therein. But they conspire against none but their own souls and they do not perceive it. When you look at the history of all prophets, it is often the most powerful and the most authoritative members of a society who stand in stubborn resistance to God's prophets. And you see this in every prophet, in every city or society that any prophet has been sent. If you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who opposes the Prophet in Mecca? Is it the guy who's selling fruits in the street? It's people like Abu Sufyan, people like Abu Jahan, the elites, the aristocrats, the people who have influence. These are the ones who typically oppose the Prophets. Why? Because they are the ones who became rich, who have benefited from the status quo. They've benefited from the economic system. They've benefited from the social constructs. They've benefited from the hierarchy that they've established. So the ones who oppose the prophets are the ones who have the most to lose in the worldly sense. So you find during the advent of Islam, it was the likes of Abu Jahan, Abu Sufyan, Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, the wealthiest of Mecca, the most powerful. If you look at the example of Musa alayhi salam, who opposes Musa? Fir'aun. And not only Pharaoh, the elites of Egypt. If you go to Surah Yunus, verse 75, or verse 25, I'm sorry. ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَا, Allah says, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ مُوسَى وَهَارُونَ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ وَمَلَئِهِ we sent Moses and Aaron, Musa and Harun, to Pharaoh and his mala' wa mala'ihi, and the elites. In other words, it's interesting that in Arabic, the word mala' literally means to fill something up. And because the elites, the notables of society, would fill up the court of Fir'aun, the verb mala'a 
became used to refer to the elites and the most notable people in a society. So Allah sends Musa and Harun to Fir'aun and his mala, the elites, and how did they respond? But they were arrogant. They opposed Musa. So during the lifetime of the Prophet, the powerful, the wealthy, the influential opposed Rasulullah. During the time of Musa, السلام, Pharaoh, the elites of Egypt, they opposed Musa and Harun. Even during the time of Isa, السلام, the time of when, when Jesus Christ was sent to the children of Israel, who opposed him? Who opposed Isa? The rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, the people of influence. They're the ones who oppose because they are the ones who have profited off of the status quo. Now, now the question is, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, we have placed within every city the greatest of its criminals to conspire? It's almost as though Allah is attributing the crimes of these individuals to himself. He says, we place them there. Now, does this mean that Allah compelled them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted free will to every human being. Now, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this earthly life, he has put every human being through trial and test. Now, an objective test, one of the ways to, to, to test or to assess the objectivity of an exam is that you look at the results of the exam. If the results of the exam can be represented using a bell curve, you know, for those of you who've studied education, you know that one of the indicators of a fair exam is that when you get the results, if you can plot the results and they form a bell curve, that means that that was a, a fair exam where you have a handful of people that excel, you have a handful of people that fail miserably, and then you have about 60, 70 percent who are in the middle. Similarly, you find that in this life, you have a handful of people that excel, you know, MBA, Imams. And then you have a handful of people that fail miserably. You know, these Wanims, you know, Fir'aun, Yazid, the Mu'awiyahs, the, these individuals. And then the rest of the people are in the middle. Now, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who has created this exam and this trial, He attributes the existence of these criminals to Himself. Because a system of free will allows people to reach their full potential, whether it's, you know, excelling and becoming the elite among the pious, or failing and becoming among the wicked, or being an average person. In verse number 124, what, and, and, and by the way, just as a side note, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes uses the word Medina to describe a city, and other times Allah uses the word Qariya. Qariya literally means village. It, it's a word that refers to an area that's not developed. Now, we usually call an area a village if it lacks infrastructure. You know, if it's a very simple place, we call it a village. But if you see that there's an area that has skyscrapers and it has, you know, impressive in infrastructure, we call it a city. But the Quran flips it. The Quran uses the word Medina when it refers to a place where righteous people live. For example, if you go to Surah Yasin, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ When Allah speaks about that area where Habib al Najah he comes to warn, the mess, to warn the people to follow the messengers, Allah refers to that area as a Medina, a city, even though from a material standpoint it was a very simple place. Most of us would have called it a village, but Allah calls it a Medina. Civilization is based on morality. It's not based on infrastructure and who has the fanciest buildings. But here, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to, you know, the city that Fir'aun was in, when he refers to these magnificent cities, Allah calls them Qariya. They're, 
morally they're villages they're very underdeveloped spiritually anyway that's that's a side note that is mentioned by some of the ulama verse 124 and when a sign comes to them, they say, we will never believe until we are given the like of what was given to the messengers of God. God knows best where he places his message. And Allah sub and, and God and He will inflict those who transgress with humiliation and a severe punishment because of what they conspired. Now this ayah refers to the, the disingenuous request for miracles. And this is mentioned in many times in this surah. And this was a major problem that the Holy Prophet faced in Mecca. Whenever the Holy Prophet would invite them to worship Allah to submit to the one true creator, they would make ridiculous demands. And it was, it was not even a genuine, a sincere request for a miracle. They were just making excuses why they were not believing. Why would they not submit? So here, they're asking, they're saying that we will never believe in you, O Muhammad, unless you bring, unless you produce a miracle like the prophets of the past. You know, it's interesting. It's not like they believed in Musa. It's not like they believed in Isa. But they want the Holy Prophet to produce miracles that compare to the miracles of Musa and Isa, السلام, for example. They, they want the Prophet to revive the dead. They want him to split the sea. They want him to perform these extraordinary acts. But again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in many of the verses that this is not a sincere request. They're making excuses. They don't want to believe. If you split the sea for them, they'll ask you for another miracle. The demand for miracles is not going to end, Ya Rasulullah. And then the ayah says, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalatan. Allah knows where to place his message. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, who was one of, who was probably the most wealthy man in Arabia, he had, he, he had many children, he was one of the most influential in Arabia, he was a master of the Arabic language, one of the most handsome men in Arabia, but he was one of the most fierce enemies of the Holy Prophet. He says, he would mock the Prophet. He would say, say If there is something called prophethood, if I concede that there is a God and there is prophethood, I am more deserving of prophethood than you, O Muhammad. Why? He gives two reasons. Two Silly reasons why he believes he should have been chosen as a prophet. He says to, to, to the Holy Prophet, because I'm older than you, and because I have more wealth. Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he says to the Prophet that it doesn't make sense that Allah would choose you. You're an orphan. You don't have the wealth that I have. You're not as intelligent as I am. I am clever. I'm business savvy. I was able to amass all of this wealth. I'm older than you. I have more experience. Allah says, Allahu a'lamu haythu risalat. Allah has a different barometer for greatness. These are human standards of success. Allah says, I know where to place my message. My message can only be given to someone with the purest heart, someone of noble character someone with compassion, someone who has a love for humanity, who has an interest in taking people to their Lord. Because you're older, that makes you qualified? Because you have money? And it's interesting, 
that after the death of the Holy Prophet, when Abu Bakr, for example, you know, essentially usurped the Khilafah from Amir al muminin and he declared himself as the Khalifa, him along with Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abu Bakr's father was alive on the day that he became the Khalifa. He comes home and he tells his father the news that I'm the, I'm the Khalifa now. I'm the successor of the Holy Prophet. Abu Bakr's father says to him that what happened to Ali ibn Abi Talib? Abu Bakr says, Ali is still young. I'm older than him and I have more experience and we felt that it would be better if I took control. Abu Bakr's father says, I'm older than you. According to that same logic, I should be the Khalifa. Human beings, they have their own standards, but the only standard for leadership that matters is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'al risalata. And then Allah says, سَيُصِيبُ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُوا صَغَارٌ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَعَذَابٌ شَدِيدٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَمْحُرُونَ Allah says, these individuals who committed crimes against the prophets, because of their arrogance, and it really boils down to arrogance, this is what's driving their animosity towards the prophet. Their arrogance, their stubbornness, their rebelliousness. Allah says, they will be humiliated before me. They will be sagam. They will be made small when they are brought to me. There's a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, la basallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Where the Imam alayhi salam, he speaks about the condition of the arrogant ones on the day of judgment. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, إِنَّ الْمُتَكَبِّرِينَ يُجْعَلُونَ فِي صُوَرِ الذَّرِ يَتَوَطْ there is a special punishment that will be given to the arrogant on the day of judgment. And that is what? You know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us appear human on the day of judgment. There will be many people who will not be resurrected as human beings. Allah resurrects you based on the appearance of your soul there are people who are animalistic in this life they have the image of a human being but in that world your true reality will emerge it will, it will manifest allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will resurrect these people according to imam al-sadiq in the form at least one phase of that day of judgment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them as small as little particles and the people will trample on them. You know, they thought they were big. Allah says, today I'll make you very small. And the people will trample over you until the hisab, until judgment is finished, and then you will be taken to Jahannam. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humiliates those who are arrogant. In verse number 125, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ وَمَنْ يُرِدْ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُ يَجْعَلْ صَدْرَهُ ضَيِّقًا حَرَجًا كَأَنَّمَا يَصَّعَّدُ فِي السَّمَاءِ كَذَلِكَ يَجْعَلُ اللَّهُ الرِّجْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So whoever God wants to guide, He expands his breast for submission and whenever god wants to misguide he makes his breast tight and constricted as though he is climbing into the sky thus does allah place defilement upon those who do not believe now the word sled literally means your chest your breast in the Holy Quran, it seems to refer to the center of consciousness, the center of awareness. It's also synonymous with the heart, with the soul. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he wants to guide someone, he expands their breast. He expands their chest. And this is this is the dua of, of Musa alayhi salam. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri. This inshirah al-sadr is very important. This is something that Allah gives to his prophets. Alam nashrah laka sadrak, Allah says to the Holy Prophet. Inshirah al-sadr in this context refers to the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes your heart receptive to the truth. You become open-minded. You become objective because all you need, brothers and sisters, to accept the truth is that you just have to be open-minded. You have to objectively consider this message. If you approach the Quran with objectivity, with an unbiased mind, the nur of the Quran will penetrate into the heart. See, this is the beauty of our relationship with God. You just have to expose yourself the light is all already there. The nur is there. You just have to expose yourself. You have to expand the heart. It has to be opened. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is why in the Quran, Musa, he has to go and speak to Fir'aun. You have to be compassionate. You have to be open-minded. You cannot be rigid. That's why he says, Rabbi shrah li sadri. Give me patience. I'm going to go talk to a man who thinks he's God. I have to have some compassion. I have to have forbearance. I'm talking to a man who slaughtered thousands of innocent children, who's going to say obnoxious things, but I always I have to keep my cool. I have to have a calm temperament. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to guide someone, he expands their breast so the light enters. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, when he describes those who are misguided, Allah says their breasts are tightened, they are constricted. The light cannot penetrate. They're closed-minded. And for them, ex accepting the truth is very difficult. It's very difficult. They won't give an inch. They won't allow a photon of nur to enter their hearts. They're like the ones who are ascending in the sky. It's very difficult to ascend through the skies. And it's very difficult for these people to accept Islam, to come to their Lord, to reconnect with their Creator. In the same way, ascending and climbing through the sky is difficult. You know how, you know how sometimes we have the expression, when something is very difficult, we say it's like going to the moon. For these people, submitting to the truth is like going to the moon. It's like ascending to the sky. It's very difficult for them. And it's difficult because of their stubbornness, because they're biased, because they're closed-minded. They have hearts that are constricted, that are closed, that are tightened. And this is why they don't embrace the faith. Now, when this verse was revealed, some of the companions, they ask the Holy Prophet ﷺ, is there a sign that someone's heart, someone's chest, someone's breast has been expanded? Is there a sign for inshirah al-sadr? Because we all want to be people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expands their chests, expands their breasts. Is there a sign? to indicate in shirah al-sadr, the Holy Prophet says, Naam. For everything there is a sign. He says the sign of in shirah al-sadr are three things. Al-inabatu ila dar al-khulud. That you're always turning, you're always focusing on the hereafter. You live in dunya, but your heart and your mind is in the Akhirah, meaning you're building, you're building for your hereafter. You live in dunya, but you're building your Akhirah. In the same way that when you're excited to go on a trip 
everything that you're doing is to prepare for that trip, to prepare for that journey. So one of the signs of inshirah al-sadr is al-inabatu ila dar al-khulud that there is a yearning. There is a yearning for the place of eternity. Dar, it's the eternal abode. This life, brothers and sisters, no matter how, you li- how long you live, believe me, it goes by very quickly. I have never met an elderly person that has told me, you know what, Sheikh? Life has gone by very slowly. No one has ever said that. Everyone says that life passes by quickly because it does. Believe me, all of us can agree that it seems, it not only does it go quickly, it seems to accelerate. Life seems to accelerate as you get older. Just the other day we were in high school. Just the other day we were in college. Just the other day you were single. Now you're married. Now you're having children. Passes by very quickly. Before you know it, you'll have grandchildren. And then there will come a day where you're going to be on your deathbed. And then you're going to see Malakul Maut and you leave. It goes by very quickly. Someone who has inshirah al-sad, they know that the moment of departure is any minute. So everything that they do, they're investing in that eternal abode. وَالتَّجَافِي عَنْ دَارِ الْغُرُورِ So a, a sign of inshirah al-sadr is that they're indifferent when it comes to the delusion of this life. If they, if they gain anything in this life, they don't get too excited. And if they lose something in dunya, they don't get too upset and disappointed. Because whether you gain, whether you lose, it's all going to come to an end. Darul Ghurur. This dunya is called the place of delusion. You know, there's the story about some of the companions of Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam used to walk and he was always followed by disciples, by other people that wanted to accompany him. On one occasion, Isa alayhi salam was walking with one of his companions and they passed by some ruins. Isa alayhi salam, he converts the stones into gold. He wants to test his companion, his student. He says to him that you have a choice. You can stay here with this gold or you can continue on your journey with me. You can continue being my student and accompany me on this journey. So the man says, Ya Ya Ruh Allah, you're a wonderful person, but this is a lot of this is a lot of gold. It's a lot of gold. So he decides to stay with the gold and he departs and he leaves Isa alayhi salam. The narration says this man is now sitting. Imagine there's like a mountain of gold, he's sitting there. When you have money, you have to protect it, yes? So now he's, you know, he's sitting there thinking about how to protect it, where to put it, and he's dreaming now about all of the things he's going to purchase. You know, just like, you know, how people are when they buy lottery tickets, they start to imagine what they're going to do with the money, how they're going to give half of the money to the masjid and feed the fuqara. You know, that never happens, by the way. So he sits by the gold. Two men appear. They see this man sitting by all of this gold. They say, what is this? Is this? Does this belong to you? He says, yes, this is my gold. They tell him, now it belongs to all of us. They threaten him. They threaten to kill him. They say, listen, either we kill you or you agree to split it three ways. He says, okay, you know, it's a lot of gold. Even 33% is plenty. So now the three men are sitting beside this mountain of gold. They're all sitting there, dreaming, thinking about all of the great things they're going to do with their newfound wealth. They're sitting there, sitting there, and then they get hungry. You know, you can't eat gold. So they say that one of us should, we should go and buy food. Take some of the gold, go to the marketplace and purchase food. They say that, listen, we can't all go and leave the gold unattended. Let, let one of us go to the market and bring back food. So the man who was originally with the gold, 
the companion of Isa alayhi he volunteers. He says, I'll go, I'll take some gold, I'll go to the marketplace and I'll bring back food. He takes some of the gold, he goes to the marketplace. As he's going to the marketplace, he buys food and poison. Because he says to himself, then why should I split it three ways? All the gold is mine. He decides to put poison in the food so he can serve it to the two other guys, kill them off, and then he gets all of the gold. He becomes 100% owner. The two men who were left behind to guard the gold, they say to themselves, why should we split it three ways? When he comes back, we'll jump on him, kill him, and we split it 50-50. It's better than 33%. The man comes back. The moment they see him with the food, they attack him. They slaughter him. They take the food. They eat. The food was poisoned. All three of them die. Three corpses beside this mountain of gold. Isa, alayhi salam, after some time, he passes by the same area. And he sees his companion dead on the ground, two other men dead. And he looks at his disciples. He says, this is the nature of dunya. It attracts you, but then it poisons you and it leaves you. It kills you. It attracts you and then it turns its back on you. Rasulullah says the second sign of inshirah al-sadr is you're indifferent towards the delusion of this life. And number three, that you're prepared for death before death comes to you. If you have 20 years of qaba prayers to make up, and you don't you only make up a few prayers every year, you're not ready for death. If you still owe people money, you're not ready for death. If you keep on postponing your trip to Hajj and you have istata'a, you're not ready for that. The one who has in shirah al-sadr is ready. It's like someone who has to leave. The taxi, the taxi is going to come and pick him up any minute. But he doesn't even have his suitcase packed. You and I, we have to have the mindset of a traveler. We have to have our luggage ready. Because any minute is the moment of departure. We leave. Verse 126. وَهَذَا صِرَاطُ رَبِّكَ مُسْتَقِيمٌ مُسْتَقِيمًا قَدْ فَصَّلْنَا الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ يَذَّكَّرُونَ And this is the path of your Lord, leading straight. We have detailed the signs for a people who remember. Just, you know, we've this verse has been repeated in this surah. I don't want to go into too much detail, but just one, uh, one insight here is that in the Qur'an, Sirat is always singular. There's only one direction, and that is towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sabil in the Quran is plural. So the word Sabil, path, can be many paths. Salah takes you to God. Fasting takes you to God. Hajj takes you to God. Being dutiful to your parents is the path towards God. But sirat is that general direction. Your direction, the direction is one. It's like if I want to go to the North Pole, there's only one way I can go. You go north. But there are many different paths that lead to the North Pole. You can go northeast, northwest. So the paths are many. But the direction is always one. Number verse 129. For them is the abode of peace with their Lord. And he is their guardian because of what they used to do. One of the names of paradise. You know, paradise has many different names in the Qur'an. One of the most beautiful names of Jannah in the Qur'an is Darus Salam. The place of peace. The home, the abode of peace. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is As-Salam. 
when, when people, when the believers enter paradise, they're greeted with salam. In paradise, there is nothing but peace. There's no animosity. There's no hatred. There is external peace. There's no violence in paradise. There's no vulgar language. There's no quarreling in paradise. There's external peace and internal peace. And before Allah allows anyone to enter paradise, Allah says, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ Allah says, I remove the animosity that is in the hearts. You know, sometimes there are two mu'mineen, but they don't like each other. They're both good, but they just don't get along. Allah, and, and this shows you that even mu'mineen can have hatred in their hearts towards others, towards other mu'mineen. It becomes a sin when you act on it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even this animosity that's in the heart, it has to be removed. Otherwise, Jannah will not be Jannah. Have you ever been in a room with someone that you feel doesn't like you? It's a very uncomfortable feeling. Even though they're not saying anything hurtful or insulting, you can feel the tension. And that gathering is not enjoyable. You could be sitting in a palace, but if you're surrounded by people who don't have hearts that are at peace, there is animosity, even at the level of the heart, it's not an enjoyable experience. Allah says paradise is the abode of peace. There's no animosity, there's no hatred. What makes paradise so pleasurable and enjoyable is that you're in the presence of Allah. You're close to Him. That's the real source of peace, being close to Him. You know, usually when you're when you take a new residence, your number one concern is safety, yes? That's why you lock the door when you leave the house. You buy a security system. Maybe Zayn has a state-of-the-art security system at his house because he has a new home now. You worry about your security. In this ayah, what does Allah say? You are given the abode of peace, Jannah, and Allah is your guardian. Allah is the one that guarantees your security and your safety. He's your wali, and the one of the duties of a wali is to protect those who he has guardianship over. Your, the father is the wali of the family, of his children. He has to protect them from harm. Allah is the wali of the believers because they accepted his wilaya in dunya, and now they enjoy the amenities and the benefits of his guardianship in Darus Salaam. Bima kanu ya'malun. They earn this because of their actions. Verse 120, 120, 128. Wayo mayahshuruhum jami'a ya ma'ashar al-jinn adistakthartum min al-ins. وَقَالَ أَوْلِيَاؤُهُمْ مِنَ الْإِنْسِ رَبَّنَا اسْتَمْتَعَ بَعْضُنَا بِبَعْضُ وَبَلَغْنَا وَبَلَغْنَا أَجَلَنَا الَّذِي أَجَّلْتَ لَنَا قَالَ النَّارُ مَثْوَاكُمْ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ حَكِيمٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the day when he will gather them together O company of jinn you have misled many of mankind. And their allies among mankind will say, those who were deceived by these beings, O oh Lord, some of us made use of others. They profited off of others. And we reached our term which you have appointed for us. And it will be said to them, the fire is your abode your resting place for all eternity, except as God wills, for He is the wise, the knowing. Now, when you read this verse, at first glance, it seems that the jinn are responsible for causing many human beings to go astray. However, the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, at least a good number of them, they believe that the word jinn here doesn't refer to you know that special creation 
that Iblis belongs to. Because the word jinn linguistically refers to any being that cannot be seen. So they say that jinn here is a reference to shayateen. So Iblis is among the jinn, and his followers, they engaged in waswasa. They would whisper into the hearts of human beings. And that waswasa has caused a lot of people to go astray. Now these individuals who were led astray by these satans, these devils, they, their excuse on the Day of Judgment is that we were taken advantage of. You know, they used us, they profited off of us. So an excuse is made, and subhanAllah, the shayateens don't have an excuse. The ones who were misguided by the shayateen, they try to put forward an excuse, you know, oh Lord, some, some of us took advantage of others. This is their, their excuse, that we were victims. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't entertain this excuse. He doesn't even get into a conversation about it because they're all guilty. The ones who were led others astray and the ones who followed these temptations, Allah says, your place is Jannah, all of you. Now, in the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ نُوَلِّي بَعْضَ الظَّالِمِينَ بَعْضَ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Allah allows the wrongdoers to support each other. You know, brothers and sisters, in this life, the oppressors, the wrongdoers, the corrupt people, they work in collaboration. They support each other. And we see it in dunya. One zalim assists another zalim. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially telling us that they support each other in this life. If you only see them on the day of judgment, they will all disavow each other. All of them, they'll be blaming each other. One zalim points at the other. It's your fault. You are to blame. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even want to hear the excuses. He says, your place is Jahannam. So in this life, Allah allows them to support each other. Because this is the place of free will, of trial. On the day of judgment, they will, they will not be able to support each other. Verse 130, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins. أَلَمْ تَأْتِكُمْ رُسُلٌ مِّنْكُمْ يَقُصُّونَ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ وَيُنْذِرُونَكُمْ لِقَاءَ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا قَالُوا شَهِدْنَا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِنَا وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَشَهِدُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا كَافِرِينَ There's one point that I'd like to mention about this verse. Jinn and human beings are accountable for Allah. They have free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah 51, verse 56, clearly says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That jinn and human beings were created to worship because through worship is how they can move towards perfection. So they both have free will. On the Day of Judgment, all jinn and all human beings, you know, they're also called the thaqalain, they will be asked a question. In a, in a way, it's, it's almost like a rhetorical question where they, whereby they're being blamed. Were there not messengers from amongst you? يَقُصُّونَ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِ who rehearse and re recite my signs to you and warn you about the meeting of this day. The Mufassireen of the Qur'an, they say based on this ayah, one could understand that there are, pro there are messengers among human beings and there are messengers among jinn. Because the verse says, Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins, alam ta'tikum rusul minkum? Were there not messengers from among you, from among jinn, 
from among human beings who communicated my signs to you, who warned you of the Day of Judgment? So there's a difference of opinion. Are there Rusul who are jinn or are prophets and messengers only human? Some scholars believe that prophets and messengers are only human. And they say that in the world of the jinn, the messengers that are called messengers in, in alamul jinn, they are messengers of the human messengers. So for example, during the time of Musa, you have Musa alayhi salam. He's a prophet and is a messenger from among the human beings. If there is one of the jinn who follows Musa, follows the sharia of Musa, the teachings of Musa, and he conveys the message of Musa to other jinn, he becomes, you know, like the unofficial messenger of Musa to the jinn. And the reason why many ulama take this position is they say that there's an ayah in the Quran that seems to suggest that prophets and messengers are only among human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Hadid, Surah 57, verse 26. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا وَإِبْرَاهِيمٌ We sent Noah and Ibrahim. وَجَعَلْنَا فِي ذُرِّيَّتِهِمَ النُّبُوَّةِ And we placed prophethood in their progeny. So some ulama, they say that the ayah says prophethood is in the progeny of Nuh and Ibrahim. Because all prophets can trace back their lineage to Ibrahim and Nuh. Therefore, all prophets, all messengers are human beings. And any messenger from among the jinn is basically carrying the message of these human prophets to the world of jinn. Even Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, we call him Imam al-Insi wal-Jinn. He is the Imam of human beings and jinn. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 131, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not destroy a city because of their injustice while their people are heedless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. He does not punish until the message has been delivered, until he sends a prophet, until he sends an imam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I don't punish people who are heedless, who are not aware of the destructive consequences of their actions. Allah punishes when the truth has been clarified. And the people have understood the message and they still reject and refuse. Allah says, that's when my punishment descends. But Allah does not punish until, He does not punish people who are heedless. He punishes only after ilqa al hujja only after He seals the case against them. Inshallah, we'll end here so we can take some questions. Allahumma Any questions or comments? Uh, just one, um, two. Uh, in the first ayah, it talks about Allah tightening the chest. Uh, it's probably a metaphor, right? But Allah is not doing that. Yes. So, what, what's the question? So, I mean, I'm sure Allah is not tightening anyone's chest, right? It's ayah, ayah number 125. Yeah. No. Yeah. 125, yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's He has created a system. You know, that that's that's the nature of of the heart. That when when a person is biased, when a person is not objective, 
that attitude, that mindset creates a chest or a breast that is constricted and tightened. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes the act of tightening the chest to himself because he created the heart, he created the soul, he gave it this nature whereby if you're stubborn, if you're closed-minded, if you're rebellious, if you're arrogant, you don't allow that nur to penetrate. And if you're open-minded, if you're objective, your heart, you're essentially exposing your heart to this light. And as I said, that's all you have to do. You know, if a person approaches the Qur'an with sincerity, with objectivity, that naturally will cause inshirah al-sadr. And Allah attributes inshirah al-sadr and tawiq al-sadr to himself because he gave the human soul, the heart, this nature. So everything is attributed to him. Um, the other was on the jinn. Um, so since all prophets are humans, so the enemies are also humans, we don't see the jinn fighting uh, or having any animosity towards the prophets. So I'm just wondering, so jinn, why would they be infidels or... Now, you, you're, you're assuming that, that okay. jinn have no animosity towards the prophets. I mean, there, there definitely would be jinn who have animosity towards the prophets. The Quran in Surah Al-Jinn tells us that even the jinns themselves, Allah, He quotes the jinn saying that there are some of us who are believers and there are some of us, some of us who are not. So there are some jinn that don't believe the Holy Prophet is a messenger. There are some jinn that don't believe that Musa was a messenger. They refuse, just like human beings. Now, obviously we don't see their animosity or their hostility towards the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're, they are beings that are beyond, you know, our empirical experience. They're beyond our five senses. But, I mean, there are definitely jinn who are, who are hostile, who commit sins, who commit crimes. But they're, they live in their own realm, in their own world. You know, is there occasional overlap? I'm sure there is, but, you know, people have a lot of stories about jinn. You know, it's difficult to, to differentiate and to authenticate, you know, which one is act, which one is true, and which one is just, you know, a figment of their imagination. But, I mean, when you're dealing with, you know, a, a subset of Allah's creation that has free will, you know, free will naturally is going to produce, you know, different types of of, uh, of beings. You know, you're going to have people who are pious, people who are wicked. That's the nature of, of a fair exam. So you just if you're going back to the example of the bell curve, you know, you have people who reach, who are on one side of the spectrum and people on the other side of the spectrum. And the same would apply to jinn. Um, in question in verse 123, when it says that like in every time we made the great ones to be guilty, wicked. Yeah. Uh, is it saying that and it's trying to understand the Arabic here? Is it saying that all of the great people in a town are always wicked, or that some of the great people are wicked? Some of the wicked people become great, but it's is it not necessarily saying that like everyone who is in a high position has to be evil? Effectively? No, what it's saying is that. And thus we placed within every city the greatest of its criminals to conspire. The ayah is basically referring to the idea that, so, so we know that whenever a prophet is sent, there's opposition. I mean, that, that's, there's, I mean, there's no example of any prophet who is sent to a community and all of them they accept and they pray salatul jama'ah with the prophet and that's it. They live happily ever after. That has happened never. So there's always opposition. The Quran here is saying that the ones who are the most fierce in opposition were the greatest, akabiram, the greatest criminals in every, in every community are usually the ones who are at the front lines in opposing the prophets. So Allah says, I have made the greatest criminals conspire conspire against you know the messengers or the prophets that they're sent to 
Akadara Mujrimiya. Akadara Mujrimiya is basically the, the greatest criminals. People like Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahan, Fir'aun, his elites, you know, the, the Jewish rabbis during the time of Isa a.s. These were the most wicked of people, you know, because they had the most to lose. They're the ones who oppose the prophets. Uh, does that make sense? Um, a bit. I guess I'm trying to figure out if this verse is implying that in this any society, even like modern times, the people who are kind of the leaders of the society, if they tend to be people who are going to be more of uh, more along the lines of like the wicked ones or the guilty ones, kind of what this is referring to. Yeah, yeah. I I, I would say definitely. I mean, you know that that's the thing with with power. You know, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, people who have a lot of influence. A lot of power they tend to develop a spirit of arrogance you know if you know if the Imam Salawatullah were to reappear today who do you think is who, who do you think is gonna oppose the Imam you know people who have power people who have money people who have wealth you know it unfortunately see that that's why when you look at human history you can group people into two main categories in almost every era of human history. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overwhelms you with ease or overwhelms you with hardship, right? If you look at history, throughout most of history, you have, there's always a huge disparity. You have people who are living very comfortably, very wealthy, and people who are just trying to survive. Even if you look at the world today, you know, there, there's, I mean, at, globally, there are very few people who are living in the middle, who are living a, a middle class life. Either you're affluent, extremely affluent, or you're dirt poor. Now, the paths that lead to Allah, there are two main paths that lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The path of ease. When Allah overwhelms you with blessings and favors, the correct response to that is gratitude. And when Allah overwhelms you with, He pours calamities on you, the proper reaction to that is patience. Yes? Now, if I were to ask you, what would you prefer? Would you want, which path would you want to go? Because both lead to God. A wealthy person who's, gra who ha who's grateful is it achieves nearness to God. A poor person, a person who's struggling, who's patient, also attains nearness to God. Now, if I were to ask you which, which option would you want, most of us would choose the path of ease. I want Allah to pour blessings on me so I, so I can be grateful and achieve nearness to Him. That's actually the more difficult one. The path of ease and comfort is more difficult. Because if you look, it's very rare that you find someone who's powerful, very wealthy, and humble, and close to God. If you look at most prophets, Suleiman, Dawood, they're the exception. Allah does that just to show us that, you know, it's possible to be wealthy and also be close to me. But when you're wealthy, when Allah gives you too much dunya, it's very easy to become delusional. It's very easy to become distracted. Allah knows that most people are addicted to dunya. And the last thing that you want to give an addict is the drug that they're addicted to. So Allah, for mo most people, Allah, Allah doesn't give them dunya. He makes them go through hardship. Why? Because poor people, the struggles of life keep them humble. You know, that's why you're going to find more religious people among the poor than the extremely wealthy. Yes? As a general rule, there are exceptions, of course. So you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most of humanity, they're not given dunya. Because that is actually the easier path to God. That's why hadith tell us most of the inhabitants of paradise are fuqara, poor people. Because when you're poor, you're a lot more aware of your neediness to God. So... You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, you know, that's that's just the, the way it is. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
sends prophets, it's usually those people, those who have power. They become wicked, they become arrogant, and consequently they, they oppose the prophets. And just to clarify, the verse is not saying that the only the there will only be wicked amongst the people in power, but it's no. just I think is it no the, the the verse is not saying that the, the people who are in power and the people who have wealth and who are the prominent, the notable people are always, you know, wicked. No. It, that's it seems like that's the general rule of thumb where, you know, whenever that people who are incredibly powerful and wealthy and influential, they have more of a propensity towards resisting the message of, of God's prophets. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Sheikh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Inshallah, I'll see you guys next week. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank, we'll you so see you thank you very much, Sheikh. Thank Allah. you so much. May Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. And his family, Inshallah. Amen.